Romans chapter 10. With God's help, we will conclude our study of chapter 10 this afternoon. I'll be reading verse 14 through the end of Romans 10. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy, by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Our subject is an urgent call to preach the gospel. And by way of opening illustration, many of you know that I worked for a Christian radio ministry for many years. And there was a man who worked in the print shop. And he was married with two children, who I was told was not a Christian. <clears throat> so nevertheless, he worked for a Christian ministry. Year after year, I'd see him in the print shop, I'd say hi to him, I'd ask him how his family is doing, and how his work is going, but I never asked him the state of his soul. One day I received a call to go to the hospital, he was in <coughs> intensive care, <clears throat> because he had a brain aneurysm, and he couldn't speak, he was laying there paralyzed on, on the gurney, and I was told by the nurse that he could hear me, though he wasn't <laughs> expected to live through the night. Well, I shared the gospel with him in his dying moments. I pleaded with him to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He passed away the next day at the tender age of 36. I remember being very convicted that I didn't share the gospel with him until he was on his deathbed. A similar experience happened some years ago, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, where my, my own father was dying, and <clears throat> my brother, my two brothers and sister were there with me in the room, and we were there until his last breath. And as his breaths became shorter and shorter, or I should say longer and longer between them. I knew that it was only minutes or perhaps a half hour before he would leave us, having been at the, the deathbed of many people and observing the process by which the soul leaves the body leading up to death. And uh, I remember the pressure that was on me not to say anything to him about his soul. Though he was dying of cancer and was heavily sedated by morphine and was, was unconscious, though he could hear, yet understand, yet it would, he was not able to communicate, his eyes were closed. Uh, I knew he understood, and I had witnessed to him a couple, two or three times, very extensively, each, on each occasion, but seeing him there on his deathbed really moved me, and in spite of what my, my Jewish Siblings would say, I, I share the gospel with him in the last half hour of his life one more time to the dismay of my sister who stomped out of the room in anger. And uh, 
pleading with my dad to put his trust in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so there are times in the lives of all of us, regardless of our position in the church, where we are expectingly and unexpectedly, with preparation or no preparation, in season or out of season, called to step up and share the gospel with people, even family members, that we have not shared with before, or at times when we least expect an opportunity to share the gospel. I want to talk to you about the urgency to share the gospel with sinners, with lost souls, because I believe our text teaches this clearly. There are many elements of the gospel that we can find here in Romans 10, 14 through 21, gospel principles or principles about the gospel and our responsibility as Christians to teach the gospel. But I want to focus on the urgency to share the gospel because I think it is clearly there in the text. And in today's message, I hope to share a few things with regard to this urgency with you. In the last two messages, we've learned in verses 1 through 13, the difference between the righteousness of works or self-righteousness and the righteousness of faith, that is the righteousness of Christ imparted to the sinner by faith in Jesus Christ. And that the righteousness of God is freely offered to all, both Jew and Gentile alike, without partiality, by faith in Christ. And this is what <clears throat> Paul is teaching us in the context, among other things. But what good will the gospel do, which communicates the need for the righteousness of God, if they don't hear the gospel? And so God now turns his attention <clears throat> from the importance of the free offer of the gospel to all, both Jew and Gentile, the whoever, in verse 13, to the means God uses to bring the gospel to us, in verses 14 and 15. He focuses, from, he shifts his focus from the cause to the method. And remember, Romans 9 is about the sovereignty of God in salvation. And chapter 10 is about man's responsibility. Chapter 10 is about election unto salvation. Uh, rather, chapter 9 is about election unto salvation. And chapter 10 is about man believing unto salvation. So then, with that in view, let's look at <clears throat> verses 14 and 15. And our first point, vindication of the gospel. Vindication of the gospel. That's what we see in verses 14 and 15. Basically, the Lord is saying that the gospel goes out throughout the entire world. And we have here, in these two verses, four questions that are interrelated and form a logical chain of thought. Each one of these questions are connected. And the first one is, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? The second question is, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? The third question, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And fourth, which is the first half of verse 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? Now remember that this chain of interconnected questions in verses 14 and 15 is introduced to us and prompted by what is said in verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this idea of calling upon the name of the Lord and the responsibility of everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, to call upon the name of the Lord if they are to be saved 
is, is the emphasis of verse 13 preparing us to, uh, for a description of the method and the details of, of calling upon the name of the Lord. So calling upon the name of the Lord presupposes a lot of activity, preparatory activity on God's part leading up to the sinner actually calling upon God. And what is this activity? Well, like I said, these four questions describe God's activity, which, which God must do that will result ultimately in the sinner calling upon the name of the Lord. Because calling upon his name is the focus of the context. And so the first question is, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? In other words, no one will call on someone in whom they don't believe. Right? They won't call upon him unless they believe in him. Very good question. The second question is, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? In other words, there can be no believing in him of whom one has not heard about. You need to know about him. You need to hear about him. They can't believe in him without hearing about him. So first we have the idea of believing in him and then hearing about him. Third question, how shall they hear without a preacher? In other words, there can be no hearing without a preacher, someone that would be sent to preach the message that they would hear. They can't hear about him unless the message about Christ is given by a preacher. The fourth question is, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? That's the first half of verse 15. In other words, there will be no preachers unless God sends them. Each one of these four things, believing, hearing, preaching, and sending, God is the one who does all that activity, who initiates that activity, who provides the motivation, the strength, the grace, the gifts for all that activity. And so there, there are four things that must be present for a sinner to be saved. God has ordained these four methods, these four instruments, leading to a sinner's salvation. Are you with me? Amen. Is that understandable in Arabic back there? Okay. First, faith, next hearing, next preaching, and next sending. Actually, it starts in just the reverse process, but God began this process at the end of it rather than at the beginning. The end of it is faith, which he asks in rhetorically in the first question. How shall, they, uh, how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? But actually the process begins with God sending the preacher and the preacher going and preaching. And thirdly, the people hearing what he's preaching. And then fourthly and last, the people believing the message that they are preaching. But God listed them here in verses 14 and 15 and actually the reverse order of the way it begins and goes through the process and ends. Now these four means that lead to salvation strengthens the truth that God has been talking about in the context of the universal offer of the gospel. Each of these four questions assumes that the offer of salvation is to everyone, Jew and Gentile. And that's what we mean when we say the vindication of the gospel in this point. The Jews had this club mentality. They didn't want to go outside the law to find salvation. They didn't want to have to deal with this new doctrine that they are saved by grace through faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They wanted to be saved within their, their, their thousand year club social religious, legal context within Judaism and the law of Moses that God gave. They wanted salvation to be restricted to, to that arena. 
and didn't want to go outside of the law to achieve salvation. They also didn't want to go outside of Israel to, to the Gentiles. They didn't want, they didn't want the message of God to leave the borders of Israel and be offered to the Gentiles. So they wanted to stay within the law and they wanted the oracles of God and its message to stay within Israel. They didn't want it to go outside of the, the nation and their responsibility as caretakers of the oracles of God. But God says no. Long ago he had predicted in the Old Testament that the gospel would go to the Gentiles. The new covenant guarantees that salvation and the message of salvation and the blessings and effects of salvation will spill over and expand far beyond the borders of Israel when the Messiah comes. And so God vindicates here in verses 14 and 15 the universal offer of the gospel to all by explaining the means by which he has ordained the expansion and propagation of this gospel imply clearly and teach clearly that the gospel is preached to everyone, Jew and Gentile. So he vindicates not only the free offer of the gospel, but the universal preaching of the gospel to everyone and anyone. But let's look a little bit more closely at each of these four things because I want to take this opportunity to make a few applications. It talks about how shall they hear or how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed. That's the ultimate goal in preaching the gospel. Is that when Christ is preached, sinners will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not converted today, you, you perhaps many times have come under the hearing of the gospel. God has brought his word to the very door gate of your ear, the very eye gate of your eye, your mind. And faith is, is the essential means of salvation. You will never become saved if you are not saved unless you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That you by faith own Him as your own. That you believe in Him and all that He did on the cross in His sacrificial, atoning, substitutionary death in your place. You must believe that He took not the world's place, but your place, you must make it personal. Faith must come down to you, yourself, and you. The personal level that he died for you, and that you believe it in your heart, that if you would trust him to save you, he would pay your sin debt and bear the wrath of God in his own body on the cross in your place instead of you. You must believe that he was the ransom that was paid to buy you back, to redeem you from a lifestyle of sin and depravity. So faith, faith is very, very important. And that is the message we preach. We preach Jesus Christ and faith in Him. This is a message that is being lost today in many places. The gospel is being diluted and being replaced with entertainment. We have a, a growing superficiality and shallowness and, and a dumbing down of the minds of the people of God, which are occupied with images, with quick images, instead of being occupied with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the depths of the doctrines of the Word of God. These are the truths that must occupy us and must be written on the doorposts of our minds and hearts. We must memorize the Word of God. We must have a clear understanding of the various components of the Gospel. We, and, and with respect to the, the doctrines of Christ connected with the Gospel, we must understand what each doctrine means so that we can communicate it to the lost. We must be thoroughly acquainted with the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ, His saving love. His propitiating death on the cross which washes away our sins. His reconciling work bringing us back to God. Reconciling us with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of redemption, the doctrine of imputation, 
of Adam's sin into the sinner, as well as the imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believing sinner. The passive and active obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must understand what this means. It lies at the very foundation of the Christian faith and our individual personal salvation. We must pick up our Bibles and begin to study and study and be workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Memorize these doctrines. Read them over and over and over again until you can explain them to somebody without reading them from a book or even from the Bible. This is very important. How then shall they call in him, on him, in whom they have not believed? And then the importance of hearing. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? The scandalous lack of sharing the gospel in the Christendom today is odious in the nostrils of God. The sinful silence of believers because of a lack of courage, because of a lack of love, a lack of uh, love for Christ, because the love, love of Christ constrains me. The lack of grace, the lack of strength from above, the lack of an open door. We need to be those who are communicating the gospel so that the lost can hear. How, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? They must hear the gospel and they must hear a gospel that is accurate to scripture. We are the caretakers of that gospel. You and I need to speak that gospel. Verbally describe it with all the skills and talents God has given, given us verbally and with our minds and intellects and imaginations. We need to describe the gospel patiently if we have such opportunities at length to communicate the gospel with the lost. We need to draw upon every gift intellectually, spiritually, and natural gift God has given us to share the gospel. And we must share it. We must share the gospel. Each and every one of you, if you name the name of Christ, you are responsible to share the gospel in word and in lifestyle. Both. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are ambassadors of Christ, the Bible says. Scripture also teaches, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The assumption is we who have frequent dealings with God often come into contact with the, with the dreadfulness or, or that aspect of God's nature and character which, which remind us in our spirits of the awesome fear of God. And that fear drives us to share the gospel with the lost because coming from our prayer closets, having a fresh dose of the fear of God, being baptized in that fear, we will look at men and women differently. We will see them as those who need the grace and mercy of God. They need to be saved. We will pity them. We will look at them with eyes of, of, of desire and love. We want to see them saved. So we must share the gospel. This is not reserved for Pastor Joe. After all, we pay him a salary to preach the gospel. This is not a duty reserved only for our street preachers who go to San Francisco and preach the gospel with other believers passing out tracts. This is a responsibility that all of us have. They will not hear unless we share it with them. Why? Because God has ordained it this way. He has restricted the communication and propagation of the gospel verbally through his people. And if we don't share it, it won't get shared. Oh, God may direct people to read the Bible and read a book or watch a TV program. But those are secondary means. The primary means is through the people of God who daily are resurrected to become doctrines on fire. Filled with the Holy Spirit in their hearts and filled with the bristling knowledge of the gospel in their minds. We go forth and we communicate this glorious gospel. It's a glorious gospel. It's good news. It, it, this gospel, when, 
when the Holy Spirit unveils its glory to our hearts, we're enraptured with it. We're swept up with it. We can't wait to share it. It is so glorious in its implications and in its message to deliver sinners who are on their way to a place of torment and punishment that is unceasing in nature in terms of its, its punishment transcending time. The smoke of such torment will rise forever and ever and be a reminder to all intelligent creatures in God's universe of His awesome justice that will not be swept under the rug and be replaced with His love. All of His attributes are independent and deserve equal attention. But thank God Thank God for his love that was displayed on the cross in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very God of very God, who was sent from the heart and plan and purpose of the Father to die a death that, that is unthinkable for even the most vile among us. But the Son of God himself died such a death that sinners would know his love. The greatest statement of the love of God in the history of the world is seen on the cross. Amen. And that is the message we must communicate because the world doesn't know of that love and doesn't know the reason behind that love that God does not delight in the death of the wicked but that they should turn and live. God did not allow Adam's posterity to go its own way, go their own way. All he had to do was just back up and let Adam's race Go their own way and everyone would have went to hell. Everyone would have been burning in a lake of fire and brimstone. Everyone, all of us, and deservedly so. But no, no, no. Part of God's plan was to put up a stop sign and wait a minute. I'm going to devise such a plan. The accomplishing of which will elevate and magnify my love in such a way. That... Only those who put their trust in my son, who was the agent of procuring their salvation and their reconciliation and their deliverance from sin, will be able to know that same love in their own hearts, agape love. It's a love only, reserved only for the children of God and those who are being saved. No one else knows about this love. It's divine love. And God wants that love to be magnified and exalted, understood, and experienced by his people and by the world at large to a certain extent. But thirdly, notice again, the third question, and how shall they hear without a preacher? The implications are twofold. First, he's referring to the office of a pastor. And secondly, the general responsibility of believers in witnessing. It encompasses all the word of God as it goes out through his people. And, but specifically, and all the commentators are unanimous on this, it is primarily, not secondarily, but primarily referring to the role and office and work of a pastor. God has given pastors the primary responsibility of preaching and teaching the Word of God, including the Gospel. He's gifted them with an understanding and, as, of, of the truth and an ability to organize it and coherently deliver it in a way that would edify people and also give them gifts to be able to preach that Word unto the same edification. And. God has joined the gospel with the preacher and made a wonderful marriage with those two. But we see that fewer and fewer preachers are taking up the mantle of preaching the gospel and the responsibility inherent in it very seriously. Their focus seems to be shifted, many of them, but thank God there are a few faithful ones left, comparatively speaking, proportionately. But, but it seems like the sacred 
responsibility of preaching the gospel, to be men of the word, men of the cross, men with a message of the cross and the gospel, and to develop that, that ability to preach it with power and with grace and with help from the Holy Spirit and with more and more understanding as they go along. It seems like that, that sacred, privileged responsibility to be God's spokesman and caretakers of this glorious gospel is, is being exchanged for frivolous and secondary responsibilities that consume their time. God intended pastors to primarily be studious men of the Word of God and to be shepherds of the sheep. It's a twofold responsibility. And they are to be devoted at least 90 plus percent of their efforts to those two responsibilities for the church's benefit and for the gospel's sake and to preserve a pure and accurate witness of the full gospel, the full orb, accurate gospel in every generation. And so the gospel needs the Christian ministry to be able to convey it by hardworking, diligent pastors who work very hard and with the anointing and blessing of the Holy Spirit are able to, to preserve the purity of the message, the purity of its doctrines, and, and all that the gospel, in, uh, uh, that, that all that the gospel God intended to convey to a dying world. Pastors are charged with, with preaching that gospel. It's the same message. We don't change it. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. Regardless of any other considerations, monetarily, or any other ecclesiastical benefits that might come from, from uh, changing things, or diluting, or adding, or refocusing the attention of the pastor. The pastor is responsible to, to be faithful to God, number one, regardless of what he must suffer, what he must sacrifice, what he must give up, even though a majority of other worldly pastors are gaining in other areas. A true God-sent pastor must be faithful to maintaining an educated ministry in the first place. The church and its ministers are all about the Word of God. The Word of God receives a central place in the life of the church. The attention is on the Word of God because the people need to hear from God, and therefore the pastor needs to hear from God. The pastor needs to be thoroughly acquainted in his responsibility of of accurately and faithfully bringing forth the Word of God in an expository way, expository preaching and teaching, going line upon line, verse upon verse, through the Scripture, so that the people of God are regularly coming under the whole counsel of God. Pet doctrines and overemphasizing certain doctrines at the expense of the other, or certain themes at the expense of all the other major themes of the Bible is to be avoided. And I think all of us are, are guilty of some of these things from time to time. But hopefully we learn lessons. We learn lessons. But, uh, but the gospel not only needs an educated ministry to convey its accurate truth, and spirit, uh, doctrinal components, but it needs a spiritual ministry. The gospel on the receiving end must bite. It must have an impact. It must, why? Because God wants to change the heart. His goal is to change the mind, to change the spirit, so that the individual is conformed in the totality of his being, mind, heart, and spirit, to the perfect will of God. So we need to have a spiritual ministry. The gospel needs a cross-centered ministry. The cross needs to, to be occupied more and more as, as the major focus of every message as much as possible. 
It's, it's a skill that God gives. It's not easy to do, especially when you come across the next text in the exposition that, that says very little of the cross. It requires grace and hard work and insight from the Holy Spirit. It requires help from God to bring out the elements of Christ and his cross from every text of scripture because the Bible is all about Christ and Christ is in every word, every verse, one way or the other. Do you believe that? Amen. The end of the law is Christ. It's all about him <coughs> and his person and his work. And so the gospel needs not only a Christ, a cross-centered ministry or Christ-centered ministry, but a praying ministry. Because we're not only the preacher, but as the church is responsible as well in, in certain ways to be caretakers of the gospel, we don't assume that, that uh, when we share the gospel, everything will take care of itself. God commands us to pray, asking Him to bless the efforts, our gospel efforts. And we have multifaceted gospel efforts going on in this church. We have multi-layered gospel efforts. We have international missions connected with the gospel in our outreach as a church. We have street preaching. We have First Love Publications, the printed page where almost half of our publications are, are gospel messages in book form or in track form. We have Bible studies going. The gospel is, we have the San Quentin and Jamestown prison ministries where the gospel is being preached to the prisoners. We have the Bay Area Rescue Mission where the gospel is preached on the second Wednesday of every month. For the last 16 years, God has given us grace to go to the Bay Area Rescue Mission. And we've turned this, over, this ministry over to the men uh, who, who are given gifts to teach and preach and we let them run with it. And we, we try to get all those who are, who are gifted in, in this area of preaching and teaching to, to communicate the gospel. But I'm, 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 I'm telling you now, brothers and sisters, we're, by God's grace, we're going to the next level. I pray in usefulness and profitability among all of us, but especially among potential pastors and preachers and teachers among us. We're, by God's grace, we're going to go to the next level in terms of educating, going deeper in the Word, and training these brethren, also in giving them opportunities to, to proclaim the gospel. Because the gospel is being lost, not only as an art of preaching, but also the message itself is being greatly diluted in every, every place you turn. And each individual local church is responsible to maintain the purity and life of the gospel where they are at in their community and in, their, in, the, in, in each individual's life. And that's what we have to do. And we must press forward with it. And ladies, those of you who may not be directly involved in preaching in some of these ministries of the gospel that I've described, it's incumbent upon you to pray. To pray for the Lord's blessing upon all these efforts, including your own, through your own opportunities to share the word with your children or with others, maybe a letter, maybe a phone call, maybe your example, to ask the Lord to bless your gospel witness, your lifestyle, and the word that you share. But the gospel needs the Christian ministry to be a compassionate ministry. We need to maintain the love of God in our gospel preaching. And also, as I suggested in my title, the gospel needs an earnest ministry joined with it. It's, it's sickening to me to see a, a slothful, apathetic, complacent presentation of the gospel. It doesn't fit, does it? The message with the method of conveyance. If you look at what the message is all about, it should cause the messenger to be burdened, to be zealous, to be earnest, to be urgent in sharing the truth. The New Testament teaches that the main business 
of spreading and teaching the gospel is the work of men specially commissioned to do so. And, and uh, in verse 15b, we see then that this, this uh, quote from the Old Testament, um, how, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. The immediate context of this quote in, in Isaiah uh, was the joy that the Israelites were experiencing after coming back from captivity. That's the historical context. But the larger context, of course, God refers uh, to not only the gospel itself as good news, but as the blessing that the recipients and the hearers are of that good news, uh, or they should consider themselves at least, uh, blessed to hear glad tidings from God himself through an, a God-ordained messenger. And so, in verse 15b, Israel as well, if I may make an application to Israel, God is saying here, by quoting this Old Testament text from Isaiah 52, 7, Israel is without excuse for their unbelief because God certainly sent heralds of salvation to preach the gospel, the good news of salvation to Israel. And, and uh, from Isaiah 52, we see that this is proof that they are without an excuse for their unbelief. God also prophesied through the prophets the sending of the gospel light to the Gentile nations. The scriptures foretold this, that the Gentiles would, would hear the gospel and be saved. Now, in this context, in verse 15, Paul is showing that the Jews had full opportunity to call upon the Lord, especially in verses 12 and 13. No distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There were rare instances in the Old Testament of Gentiles becoming saved, but still, a number of Gentiles did become saved. Rahab the harlot, we see Ruth the Moabitess, we see Naaman the leper from Syria. A number of uh, proselytes that came into the Jewish uh, faith also came into contact with the gospel trusted in God, in the person of his son, even though he had not come yet at his first advent, and they were saved. So Paul is showing the Jews that though it was rare in the Old Testament for a Gentile to get saved, the gospel was still being preached to them. And now in the New Testament, it's rare when a Jewish person gets saved, the gospel is still being preached to them. So God is saying the gospel really is, has always been gone throughout the whole world in one way or another. And Paul demonstrates that the Jews had full opportunity to call upon the Lord as the quotes from Joel 2.27 in verse th uh, 2.32 rather makes clear and Isaiah 52.7 which is quoted here in verse 15 makes clear. Uh, the gospel of, of peace was preached uh, among the Jewish nation. All along, the Old Testament law pointed the Jews to Christ, but the large majority of them refused to believe except a small remnant. Let's go to our second point then, the rejection of the gospel, verses 16 and 17. First, the validation of the gospel, specifically in it being preached to all people without exception, but now the rejection of the gospel in verses 16 and 17, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed that report? So that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now these verses continue the argument that the unbelief of Israel was, was foretold, which is confirmed by the quote from Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Who has believed that report? If you turn to Isaiah, and let's quote that, that verse in context. Of course, Isaiah chapter 53 is the most well-known condensed version, thank you, of the gospel in the Old Testament, right? Isaiah is, is known as a book 
as the gospel of the Old Testament, but chapter 53 in Isaiah is known as a condensed uh, version in itself of the gospel within, within uh, that, that book. And it's the most famous messianic prediction and prophecy of the suffering nature of the Messiah, of the Messiah's work in his substitutionary death on behalf of his people. Now, in, verses, uh, in verse 1 of Isaiah 53, we read, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, these verses, like I said, continue this argument that the Jews are without excuse, though they have, they have made a decision, they made a choice, like many unsaved people do, like all unsaved people. They make a choice to accept or to reject the gospel. Most Jews in the Old Testament rejected it. And this verse in Isaiah 53 has an immediate application to Israel, which is what I just said. They rejected the gospel. And when you reject the message, you also ultimately reject God himself, right? Because the message comes from God. As God told Moses, look, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, if you turn there, we look at one reason why the Israelites were punished and chastised. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. So God brought the knowledge to them. The knowledge of what? The knowledge of how to be saved. The knowledge that God wanted the Jews to put their trust in Him, leading to their salvation. He, was, he sent prophets and priests and scribes who were intimately acquainted with the law of God and gifted to communicate that law among the people. He brought that knowledge to their very ears. But they made a choice. They rejected the knowledge and therefore rejected God. And God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. Now, how many in here today, in this room, or listening to this message, have been going back and forth? Should I? Should I not? Does he love me? Does he love me not? My friend, there is a line you can cross over where the opportunity to believe will not be as powerful, will not weigh as heavily on you, will not drive you as, as hard as it has in the past. Seek the Lord while he is near, the Bible says. Call upon him while he is found. And so I plead with you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to Christ today. Don't reject Him yet another time. Don't let that rejection be another nail in your coffin, as it were. Come to the one who is so patient and kind and loving, long-suffering all these years, bearing with you, rejection after rejection, so one-sided a relationship. He comes to you, you reject Him. He comes to you, you reject Him. It's the same old story. And after 10 years, 20 years, maybe 30 years, however old you may be, God in love and mercy and pity and patience has hung in there with you. But there is an ultimate rejection where God will say, thus far and Seek him while he may be found. Mercy will flow from his throne into your heart if you will lay your life down at the foot of the cross. If you will turn your whole life, not 90%, not 99%, but your whole life over to Jesus Christ. As he said, he that, unless you forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. If you give him your heart, your life, if you turn away from your own efforts, your own works, and tell the Lord Jesus Christ you cannot save yourself, this, this false hope that, that, that you've 
embraced all these years that thinking that if I just try harder or if I'm uh, read the Bible or go to church or do this or that God will look at me and be happy with me there is nothing you can do that will make him happy with you if you are outside of Christ because you are doing it on the grounds of your own works and your own unrighteousness and we've already learned that the only righteousness that the Lord that the Father accepts is the righteousness of who? Jesus Christ, as it is applied to your account. But you must come to Him and you must, you must put your whole life in His hands. You must trust His promise where He says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You must believe that in your heart that if you trust Him to save you, though you cannot see Him, you cannot hear Him, you cannot feel anything, you're, you're, you're just as dead and miserable and weighed down with the guilt of sin as you ever have been. But you believe with all your heart that His promise is true and He cannot lie. And if you will trust His Son to save you, He will keep His word and He will save you. But you must come to Him on His terms. And what are His terms? He wants everything. You say, that's all? Well, whatever it is, He wants everything. Your whole life. Your talents, your skills, your mind, your intellect. He doesn't want you to waste it on the world like He used to. He wants everything now. He's worthy of it. He's worthy of it, is he not? Amen. He sent his son to die on the cross to save you. He wants everything. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his own cross daily and follow me. But what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul and is lost? And so don't be like the Jews who rejected the gospel each and every time the Holy Spirit took that gospel and knocked on the door of their hearts. They slammed the door in God's face. Oh, may God give you the grace to open the door. Because Revelation 3.20 says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he will he with me. We have the presentation of a Christ who is eager and desirous to come into your heart and change your heart and, and give you a new heart, taking away the heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh and changing you from the inside out, giving you a new nature, making you a new man, defeating the old man and not allowing him to come in and dominate your life every waking moment of the day, bringing you into bondage, Making that ball and chain that you drag around heavier and heavier and heavier by the day. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is very enthusiastic about coming into your heart and your mind and your spirit. Taking over and supplying you the grace on a daily basis to live for Him. To dedicate your life to Him. Well... In verses 16 and 17, the main point here is that there must be a report to be believed. Where it says, who has believed our report? Again, this is more fodder, more evidence that there must be a proclamation of the gospel if it is to be heard. And that there must be a hearing of it if it is to be believed. The report went out to all the nations in one way or another, but not many believed. Even in the Old Testament, there was a report about Jehovah God, whether it be word of mouth or other ways, which we'll talk, look at in a second. As we look at verse 17 then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This indicates that faith comes through the message that is contained in the word of God. That's why the church and its ministers ought to be people of the word of God. People of the word of God. The Bible says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. We will be sanctified as we become more acquainted with the word of God. We need to find more time in our daily schedules and routines. Not to approach our Bible reading and meditation and study of it as something that we must get through to save our conscience. No. 
Properly reading and studying the Word of God is probably the most difficult task for you to do on a daily basis. It's something you just don't get through. It requires the illuminating teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit for you to absorb what God intends for us to absorb from our study of the Word that leads to edification, maturity, and growth. It's absorbed by the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. So when you study the Word, there's a time somewhere in there as you approach your study with a clear conscience and clean hands and a pure heart and there's more freedom from God for God to work within your heart. You study and read and meditate and the Spirit takes that Word, makes it understandable, and unveils the, Christ, the, uh, the principle of Christ in that, that word you're studying to edify you, to edify you, to feed you, and to bless you. <clears throat> Psalm 119 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You say, well, I'm weak, Pastor Joe, in faith. I need more faith. Well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The Word of God. Read The more you read of the Bible and study it and the Spirit's at work, you will grow in faith. <clears throat> there will be commensurate trials with that growth in faith, but you will grow in faith. I've heard testimonies of of believers, one among us off the top of my head, Lucinda Myers, who got saved by reading the Bible. As she kept reading and persevering through her study, book after book, the Holy Spirit met her there and increased her faith, gave her faith to believe what she was reading about and to put her trust in the one that, that has as the, the, the main object of all the Word of God, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastors must be knowledgeable in the Word, proficient in handling the Word, rightly dividing it. Or else we could talk about the need for faith as pastors, but we ourselves may be trusting in worldly means and inventions to expand our ministries. But then, as we move on to... In verse uh, 15, I did not look at the fourth question in terms of its uh, practical application. It says, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? Pastors need to be sent by God. It, it never ceases to amaze me how many seminaries and deacon boards and church boards responsible for hiring their pastors circumvent this part of the process. They neglect this part of the process. Are, are they grappling with the question, are, it, it, do we want the pastor to be sent by God? They may be sent by the seminary. They may be recommended by another church or another person. But is the pastor sent by God? Because if he's not sent by God, do we want him to be a pastor of our church? Or any church? No, we don't. First and foremost, he must be sent by God. He must be given the gift of being a pastor. And he must be sent by God at the right time. Moses was, was given the gift to lead the people of Israel and be their earthly deliverer. But the timing wasn't right when he first launched out, was it? He had to go back to the backside of the desert for another 40 years. The first 40 wasn't good enough training. So they must be sent by God, and the timing must be God's. That's what Hebrews 5 talks about. No one takes this honor unto himself, but is called or sent by God, as was Aaron. And the next verse talks about the Lord Jesus Christ himself in verse 5, being sent. He himself did not take this honor unto himself, but the Father sent him into the world. So if you are called to be a pastor, you must first be sent by God. And there's two confirming witnesses that indeed God has sent you. First, there's the inward call. That is, the Holy Spirit inside of you will confirm and affirm that you are called to be a pastor. And that takes place in various ways which we don't have time to discuss in this message. But secondly, there's the outward call. 
There's the involvement and participation of the church in the call to the ministry, which also has various points and components to it. But it's very important that pastors be sent by God. And so that is critical. Now, the wicked perish without true gospel preaching. But gospel preachers cannot do the work unless they are sent by the Lord through the churches. Every apostle worked through the churches and with the churches. Pastors work with the churches. They're not mavericks, they're not self-sent. I come across many, many young men who have no clue how they are to be called or trained for the ministry and especially in my foreign opportunities uh, to preach at conferences, I get constant questions and uh, on, along the lines of, uh, am I called? Churches should be praying that God would raise up men to go into the highways and byways of life. This church needs to be praying more and more. God is sending us men, more and more men over the last two to three to four years in particular, who love the word and love to minister and, want, and have laid down their lives and sacrificed much for the cause of Christ. And they desire to be trained and equipped. And it's the church's responsibility to train its ministers, not parachurch organizations, as well-meaning as they may be. There's an absolutely indispensable, necessary ingredient in the training of pastors that must be added to their equipping that only the local church can supply. If you rip the man out of the context of a local church for his training and put him in some other environment as, as good as it may be in forming his gifts and, and in the formation of his skills, the, there is an ingredient that cannot be replaced that, that the local church alone uh, has to offer. And, and, uh, and that is the, the observation and help with the development of his graces, character, and gifts. In Acts 6, we see this at work. A great example where the apostles went to the people when the first seven deacons were chosen. And the apostles taught the people the qualifications of the deacon. The people being spirit-filled and having discernment and wisdom from above looked out from among them. And with the information, the criteria for the qualifications of the diaconate that the apostles supplied to them, and with the wisdom and insight that the Holy Spirit gave them in their minds and hearts, they chose these seven men full of wisdom of the Holy Spirit whom they set over the work. The apostles delegated the work of choosing and electing to, to the people. So they didn't think, that is the apostles, didn't think the people were stupid or ignorant. There are some churches that that is the case because they're not taught. They're not given the criteria by which to use in the calling and choosing and electing of deacons and elders. So we need to teach the people. But then once we teach the people the qualifications of pastors and deacons and we explain what they're to look for and we use the scriptures as the basis of it all, then we pray and we trust the Holy Spirit will work in the hearts and minds of the people to overrule and to guide the congregation as a whole. At least a large majority, with rare exception, will, will guide the congregation into choosing its officers, deacons and elders. So churches are part of the process and therefore a very important part. I'm going to stop there. Uh, uh, I didn't get to finish the third point, the witness of the gospel. God willing, we'll look at that next time. But there's got to be this urgency and earnestness in preaching the gospel. Too many people are going to hell. One person going to hell is too many. I was told 150 to 200,000 people die every day and go to hell as lost sinners. And there are people in our community that, that need to be reached with the gospel who have not heard yet the gospel. They, they've heard the four spiritual laws, perhaps. They've heard a, a little bit about the love of God. 
churches and the, and the members of these churches need to communicate the depth and the width and the length and the height of the gospel. We need to be thoroughly familiar with the cross and the meaning of Christ's death on the cross. The atonement. What does the atonement mean to an unsaved person? How does Christ's death on the cross and the symbols, the symbols of that death that they see, how does that relate to them where they live and move every day in their life? We have to bring the gospel which explains all this with urgency and share with them that there is a critical relationship between them and Jesus Christ who died on the cross and we need to help them make that connection and connect the dots or else they will blindly go on ignorant believing that that their works will save them or their good deeds or their good works outweigh their bad works or their aunt Betty told them that they were they were a good boy she saw an angel in his eyes and they'll go to heaven we've got to dispel these myths by bringing in the gospel the gospel when it's brought in the Holy Spirit will take over he doesn't need our help we need to bring in an accurate message with urgency and earnestness and love. The love of Christ. And the Holy Spirit will come in and He will take hold of the word that He gave us. He inspired. And He will work His skillful, wonderful ways um, applying that message to the mind and heart. But we are the delivery method and instrument of God. And we need to make sure that the message we bring is accurate, powerful, deep, and wide, and faithful to the Scripture. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this awesome and privileged and yet intimidating responsibility sacred responsibility to be caretakers of the gospel and forgive us if we've neglected it and taken it for granted. Lord, we pray that we, all of us, from the least of us to the greatest, from the crown of our head to the sole of our foot, would be workmen needing not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, the gospel, the message of salvation that you have entrusted to our care. Forgive us, Lord, but also help us to approach this responsibility with renewed vigor and determination and strength and grace to be faithful day in and day out, reflecting the gospel in our, uh, through our lives, our character, as lights shining in darkness, but also uh, deepening our understanding of all the glorious components of the gospel, committing them to memory, reviewing them, taking joy in them, and then sharing them, Lord, sharing it with the lost. Lord, bless our efforts. We need your blessing. We need your help. Unless you build the house, we're laboring in vain who build it. Bless our gospel outreach efforts in every way. But let all these efforts spring from a vital, healthy, loving, intimate communion with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Spirit every day. Give us grace. Give us grace to share the gospel out of love for Christ as our primary motivation. For this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.